Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is whether sanctions are effective in stopping potential proliferators. We're going to answer that question over two phases. The first half of this lecture is going to address what sanctions actually do on the ground. What incentives do they change to convince potential proliferators to lay down their arms programs? The second half will answer the central question of whether those sanctions are effective. There's a perception out there that sanctions are not a particularly good proliferation deterrent. But the central takeaway that I want you to get from watching this lecture is that there is a barrier to inference to understanding the effectiveness of sanctions. And in particular, if you look at observed instances of sanctions, you're going to have a distorted belief about their effectiveness. They're going to look not particularly effective. When in truth, sanctions are a very important part of the non-proliferation regime's toolkit. They're not a perfect solution, but they are very useful. Let's begin with what sanctions actually do, starting with the most obvious. They increased costs. Imagine that you're Japan and you're thinking about developing a nuclear weapon. Think about who your biggest trading partners are. You have the United States, where you send $134 billion in exports every year. You have China, where you send $132 billion in exports every year. And you have South Korea, where you send $53 billion in exports every year. None of those three countries would respond positively. Although the United States and Japan are allies, the U.S. has a long history of being against proliferation. South Korea and Japan are no longer enemies, but there's still a colonial history there. As a result, South Korea would fear a rise in militarism within Japan. And tensions between Japan and China have always been there, peaking of course with World War II. The point is that none of the three major trading partners of Japan would view Japanese proliferation positively. In turn, Japan would have to expect some trade being tightened if they were to go down that route. This leads to an interesting empirical relationship that the quantitative literature in nuclear proliferation has uncovered. Consider three levels of income. You have low-level income countries like Rwanda, middle-income countries like Iraq, and high-income countries like Japan. Low-income countries can't develop nuclear weapons. They simply don't have the money to do it. High-income countries do have the money to do it, but because they benefit so much from international trade and fear loss of that trade during the proliferation process, they choose not to develop nuclear weapons. Middle-income countries hit a sweet spot. They have enough money to build nuclear weapons, but they are not so heavily involved in international trade that they are concerned about the results of economic sanctions. As such, we see proliferation behaviors maximize in that middle range. Costs can also be placed on the regime itself. As an extreme example of this, here we have Mohammad Javad Zarif, Iran's foreign minister, shaking hands with then Secretary of State John Kerry. During the Trump administration, the United States imposed a sanction directly on Zarif, preventing him from entering the country. Things like this, designed to make a particular individual within a regime's life more difficult and more complicated, either freezing their movement or freezing their assets, gives that individual more incentive to lobby their government, the regime overall, to stop with the nuclear program. Another thing sanctions can do is increase the vulnerability of the country developing nuclear weapons. Continuing with Japan as our running example, the United States has a large contingent of soldiers stationed in that country. The U.S. and Japan also engage in arms trade, where the U.S. sells important military technology, like these Phantom fighter jets, to Japan. If Japan were to try building nuclear weapons, it would put those sorts of alliance benefits at risk. That would leave Japan with a period of vulnerability. When it starts developing a nuclear weapon, it will not have the protection of the United States, and it won't have the protection of the bomb until that program is successful. In fact, the United States has incorporated these concerns into its laws. 
the Arms Control Export Act of 1976, prohibits shipments of weapons to countries that are engaged in unsafeguarded ENR technology. Those are the enrichment and reprocessing technologies that are designed to create fuel for a nuclear weapon. The third thing sanctions do is halt civilian nuclear infrastructure. Consider the incentives of the United Arab Emirates. They're in the middle of constructing multiple nuclear power plant reactors. However, they do not have the ability to fully operate these nuclear power plants on their own. Specifically, the UAE needs to receive shipments of nuclear fuel. The U.S. has a role in this by providing uranium hexafluoride gas. That's the form of uranium that you put into a centrifuge to spin around to separate the fissile 235 from the non-fissile 238. If the UAE were to try developing nuclear weapons, they would run into a problem here. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Act of 1978 stops the United States from helping out countries with civilian nuclear projects if they are currently engaged in a weapons program. As a result, working toward a nuclear weapon after the UAE had built a power plant would raise the opportunity cost of a proliferation program. As we'll talk about later on in the course, this is an intentional design decision by the non-proliferation regime. This photo is actually a meeting between the IAEA and representatives from the UAE. The International Atomic Energy Agency realizes that constructing nuclear power plants can shift domestic priorities in a country. And the gamble is that by shifting this in a particular way to incentivize the scientific, peaceful uses of the atom, that the countries will have less incentive to develop nuclear weapons. The fourth mechanism of sanctions is regime change. For a moment, it might help to differentiate a country developing a nuclear weapon from a leader developing a nuclear weapon. Let's think about Muammar Gaddafi from Libya and Saddam Hussein from Iraq. Both of these leaders had a personal incentive to develop nuclear weapons. Their international rivals, however, did not like this and instituted harsh economic sanctions. This caused both of those countries to suffer from undue poverty. Now think about this from the perspective of a political rival within one of these countries. You are getting poorer as a result of the economic sanctions. That, in principle, gives you more incentive to initiate a coup. If your coup is successful, the leader is gone, there's no reason for the international community to continue the economic sanctions, and so your economy recovers, and there's more money for you. The last mechanism of sanctions, and perhaps a last resort, is to simply slow down the program. Building nuclear weapons is an expensive and technologically intensive process. By imposing economic sanctions, you're shrinking the budget constraint that a state has. As a result, it might not be able to spend as much money on the program, thus delaying its success. You're also instituting technological trade barriers, which then make it harder for these countries to import parts of the machines that they might need to build a nuclear weapon. None of these things will make it impossible to proliferate, but it will slow the process down. And if you're a member of the non-proliferation regime, you prefer a country taking 20 years to develop a nuclear weapon as opposed to two. A side benefit here is that sanctions reduce the need for a preventive war. That is, sanctions prevent preventive war. Think about the logic of preventive war. The idea here is that an opponent of a potential proliferator prefers paying the costs of fighting today to suffering the disadvantageous shift in power that would occur in the future. But if that future is looking further and further down the road, that reduces the attractiveness of paying those upfront costs right away, when maybe you could delay until later. Although the U.S. didn't realize it, economic sanctions were helpful in grinding the Iraqi program down to a halt. Recall that Operation Opera, followed by the Persian Gulf War, had left the Iraqi nuclear program in tatters. After the war, the international community kept strong economic sanctions levied on Iraq. 
This left Saddam Hussein without very much money to play around with, and as a consequence, there wasn't much he could do with the nuclear program. Of course, the U.S. missed this fact, and as a consequence, preventive motivations were a central narrative behind the Iraq War in 2003. Now that I've explained what the main mechanisms are behind sanctions, let's talk about how useful they are. And in particular, I want to focus on the hidden effects of sanctions. If you think about public perceptions behind sanctions, they tend to be fairly negative. And I can understand why. North Korea is sort of a poster child for the failures of economic sanctions. This is the North Korean Yongbyon Reprocessing Center, which was pivotal to North Korea developing the plutonium necessary for the creation of the atomic bombs that they eventually acquired. The United States has levied sanctions against North Korea during the entire time that North Korea was developing nuclear weapons. And yet, of course, those sanctions ultimately did not discourage North Korea from developing nuclear weapons, and they didn't stop them in the long run from doing so either. As a consequence, one might think that economic sanctions are not particularly useful for the purposes of nonproliferation. But take a step back for a moment and think about the underlying strategic dynamics of proliferation and sanctions. A proliferator has to decide whether to quit or build a weapon, and an opponent, if the proliferator were to build, needs to decide whether to impose economic sanctions or concede the issue. Let's look at three different possibilities about the strength of economic sanctions. Possibility one is that the dynamics between the potential proliferator and the countries that could sanction it are structured in a way that the sanctions just have absolutely no effect whatsoever. What happens then? Well, sanctions are expensive for an opponent to implement, and if they aren't going to have an effect, or much of an effect at all, then there's no reason to impose the sanctions. The opponent should just concede the process. Working backward from there, the proliferator, recognizing that if it were to build, the opponent would concede, chooses to build, as long as, of course, that building a nuclear weapon is something that's feasible for the country to do on its own, if it knows that it's not going to get sanctioned. That's not the interesting case. The more interesting situations are where economic sanctions have a stronger effect. So now let's think about a time where sanctions would have a strong impact, but not a very strong impact. They're somewhat effective. What happens now? Well, now if the proliferator builds, the opponent is willing to sanction. These sanctions here are not going to be super effective, they're not going to be strong enough to stop the program entirely, but they are good enough to slow it down sufficiently, to the point that it's worth spending the cost necessary to impose those sanctions. Well, think about how that filters up this interaction. The proliferator knows that if it builds, it's going to suffer economic sanctions. But these sanctions are not particularly strong, and as a result, the proliferator would still prefer to build, knowing that the sanctions will come. In other words, the proliferator sees sanctions sort of as the cost of doing business. It's a cost that it wishes it did not have to pay, but it's better than the alternative of not developing a nuclear weapon at all. In our last case, now let's think about what happens if sanctions are extremely effective. Well, here, if the proliferator builds, of course the opponent is going to implement sanctions. They're super effective. They're doing exactly what the opponent wants them to do. They're a great deal. They're worth the cost. So the opponent is going to implement sanctions. But think about how that filters up to the proliferator's decision. The proliferator knows that if it builds, it's going to suffer the worst sanctions it could possibly experience. And as a consequence of that, building does not look particularly attractive here. The proliferator would prefer to quit. Think about that for a second, though. This is representing a situation like Japan. Japan decides not to build nuclear weapons in part because it anticipates that economic sanctions would be so bad for Japan that developing a nuclear weapon and suffering those sanctions is not worth it. They prefer to quit. But this means we only observe sanctions when they're partially effective. Situations like North Korea, where the sanctions were never going to stop North Korea from acquiring a nuclear weapon but it might stall them for three, four, five, maybe even 10 years. That's helpful, but it's not great. In contrast, when sanctions are really effective, we never see them. 
but this means that we have a distorted view of the overall effectiveness of sanctions if we're only looking at cases where they were implemented. For North Korea, it was useful, yes, but it wasn't a great solution. The situations where sanctions are a great solution, like Japan, we never see those sanctions actually being imposed because Japan is so scared of those sanctions. But this means that sanctions are even more effective than you might otherwise think, precisely because the opponent never has to pay for them. The pure threat of imposing economic sanctions on a country like Japan is enough to deter a potential proliferator like Japan from developing nuclear weapons. Which means that the opponent, that non-proliferation regime that's against development of nuclear weapons, is benefiting not only because the country that was thinking about developing nuclear weapons is not, but also because those sanctioning countries never even had to spend the money on the sanctions in the first place. The pure threat to impose sanctions was sufficient to deter proliferation. And that's why sanctions have this underrated effect out there in stopping countries from developing nuclear weapons. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.